Welcome to Trafalgar Square. We're here for Amnesty's demonstration in solidarity with the Arab Spring. We're joined by Farah Abu Shresha from Libya. Uh, Farah, um, at the moment there seems to be a lot of infighting in Libya. Um, what will it take for people to put their local, tribal and religious differences aside to unite and put Libya first and the people? Well, I, I think I'd like to, to say to begin with, but I, I, by saying that I think that there's an expectation gap at the moment. And I think that people are frustrated that the energy and enthusiasm that they started this revolution with and fought it with all their might is not being met. And I also think that the uh, National Transitional Council has a huge task at hand in order to address all the various issues that it now has. Uh, not least including that, that Libya has never had any form of civil society or governance or democracy in over 42 years. So trying to create that from scratch as well as meeting all these expectations leads to a lot of frustration by people on the ground not sort of appreciating that it's not just their issue but everybody's issue but I think that the way that it can be addressed is by listening by engaging with every single party minority individual on the ground and hearing what they have to say and involving them in the decision processes and um, I mean uh, I was told um, that the revolution what, what was actually the suffering I, suppose I spent some time in Egypt and they were saying that the revolution, where, where did it come from? Their life was good compared to theirs in Egypt. Um, what was the suffering under Gaddafi for the everyday person? I mean, Egyptians say they had, you had jobs and you had money. What, what was the real difficulty under Gaddafi? Well, as somebody who had to leave Libya when she was seven years of age because of the situation in Libya, I can only speak from my own experiences and the stories that I've heard from people on the ground. We were denied a right to making our own choices. I was denied, as was my sister, um, the right to have our fathers in our lives because he wasn't allowed to leave the country. And so we grew up without a father. And that's had a huge impact on us as, as individuals. Now we've spent more time with him, we've communicated with him. That's our personal experience. I have friends and colleagues whose parents disappeared and, and, and family members disappeared, you know, off the face of the planet who have have still to, to sort of emerge and turn up. You know, people were persecuted for offering an opinion or voicing how they felt about something or even voicing their fears. So when you have a lack of, you know, freedom of speech, a lack of liberty, a lack of basic human rights, that isn't, that isn't a way of living. And I think you have to understand that, that you know, Libyans were just defined by one man as a society. And he's not representative or was representative of Libyan society or Libyans themselves. They're a beautiful, wonderful um, race of people. And they really suffered under Gaddafi. And, and, and you campaigned for more women's involvement in uh, Libyan society and in the governments. How, how's that going? Well, to begin with, what a lot of people aren't aware of is that on the 15th of February um, of last year, it was the female members, of the female relatives of the Abu Salim uh, prison massacre um, victims that, that actually took to the streets and protested against their lawyers being arrested. And they stood there for two days in the steps of the Benghazi courthouse. And they were joined by the swelling masses. So the revolution actually was, was started by women. You know, they supported their men on the front lines. They may not have been carrying guns, but they were smuggling them. They, they, they created an underground network to, to smuggle in arms and medication and, and raise funds um, for, the, for the freedom fighters. You know, they played a massive part alongside their men in the sort of liberation of Libya, in creating the new Libya. And I think that, that they did this with the expectation that, that they would play a role in its governance and its future. And I feel that, that at the moment that they're being marginalized. We, we need to have a greater representation of, of women within um, the new Libyan government because women are a vital force within society and they do make up 51% of the population and they're a benefit to society. I mean, that is a known fact. And I think that that's why we need to engage them to, to reinforce, you know, to, to bring stability. And they are a stabilizing force and I think that's what women bring to, to the society. And do you think uh, the Libyan you know, leaders should be left to get on and sort out um, a stable government or do you think there should be more international sort of observation and pressure to encourage them to move in the right direction? No, I, I, I believe it, it's, it's uh, like all children at some point you have to let them grow you know I think what, what um, the new government can do is is to consult with Libyans um, to engage with NGOs and the ground to engage with women organizations to engage with the youth to engage with, with the Tuars and, and the various different religious um, uh, 
groups and I think also we can look to the international community but look at their triumphs and their mistakes and look at what they got right and look at what they got wrong and use that to, to become a, a sort of um, a greater partner in, in, the, in world politics and in, in the international community so using the international community as a, as a kind of platform for learning and, and looking to them not necessarily bringing them in because a lot of people feel that they don't want that sort of interference but certainly looking at, at the sort of the mistakes and the triumphs. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you. This is Glenn McMahon in Trafalgar Square for Vision on TV.